Hello and welcome to Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we chat to industry experts to get a view on what's happening on the ground and to learn about new trends emerging within the construction industry. This show was brought to you in partnership with Place Engage, a data-driven platform for more successful public consultation and community engagement for your next development project. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Lorna Hagen, Director at Construct Tuition. Lorna, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Carol. Um, before we start to learn a little bit more about Construct Tuition, um, congratulations on being named amongst the top 100 influencers in the UK. It's amazing uh, when we see women in construction stepping forward and being recognised for, for innovating within the industry. Um, it's such a huge celebration for all women in construction and for the construction industry generally. So congratulations and well done on that. Thank you. Um, so Lorna, Construct Tuition was established in 2021. You might just tell our audience about what it is that you do and the courses that are on offer. Absolutely. Um, so yes, you're correct. Construct Tuition, it was uh, established in 2021 and we do sort of two services. So we do training and we also do consultancy. And the training side of the business, very much um, both both sides of the business focus on improving quality within the construction industry. And that's really where my background's from. Uh, the training courses, one of the biggest sellers would be the one that we offer for new entrants um, into the construction industry. And very much it's graduates, apprenticeship um people that are out um, and working for on site, so the likes of main contractors, um, employees. And what we do is we teach them key inspecting skills. So really practical, really um, useful information that you just don't get from university. So um, on our concrete course, we teach you how to do slump tests, cube tests, read reinforcement drawings. And like my career, I have spent um, managing errors and um, looking at the financial and time imp- impact on them and I'm using that experience and those skills to really try and um, reduce the frequency of errors happening on our clients projects by giving those guys the key skills an example would be you know maybe concrete turns up on the site and it's not the right slump it's not um uh, you know, good enough actually to go in the pour. But a lot of these um, new entrants wouldn't actually know what to do in that situation. What is the criteria? Should I reject it? Can I keep it? Do I listen to the foreman? Or, you know, those sorts of scenarios. And that's what we teach them. We teach them those. And it has a huge financial um potential you know you have the likes of the get it right initiative there in um which is um some research which came from um off a branch of the institute of civil engineers and they're saying you know six percent of um construction turnover is lost due to errors um, and that's the direct cost of errors and then off the back of that it can be right up to 21 percent but if you look carol a profit margin in construction you'd be doing well to get three percent so if you're able to automatically get six percent um back by not having those errors in the first place and you're bumping your profit margin up to nine percent and developing your staff while you're doing it to be better engineers better supervisors sure it's a win-win for everyone um, it absolutely is. And look, I love the ethos of improving quality across construction because improving quality generally leads to, to efficiencies. You are reducing errors, so therefore improving your margins. You know, it's so um, it is absolutely a win win across the board. But um, maybe let's go back a step. You might just tell us how you you came to maybe identify this as a gap in the market. You mentioned there that your career has been spent improving quality in construction and managing errors. Um, what's your own background? Yeah, so I um, don't come from a construction family. I very much uh, liked um, sort of maths and physics. I wanted to have a job outside. And um, yeah, I decided to do civil engineering at university. um, And that's what I did. I studied civil engineering at the University of Ulster. And I wanted to work on site. So I worked for a main contractor from that like site engineer, the very roots of it, right up to sort of site manager level. And then I moved into... um, sort of a managing quality role within construction and worked on some great projects. So um, here in Ireland, you would probably best know um, the likes of DBF02, so the Newry Bypass back in like sort of 2008, 2010 era. And then I moved over to London. So I worked on um, Heathrow Terminal 2, a bit on Crossrail, and then moved into 
the nuclear environment, either decommissioning power stations or building new um, factories for the nuclear environment. And very much everywhere where quality was really, really important, um, right up through. So got promotion and promotion. And then my last role before starting this business was head of quality for a large tier one main contractor. And like I was managing maybe 300 million pound of uh, project turnover. So I was able to see across 20 projects where were the errors and what was going on. And that's what drove me to start the business. So I seen um, where were the errors? Where was the money being spent? Where was it being lost? And how should we best tackle that? You know, that was my role. And I, um, you know, realized quickly, if we trained the right people in the right skills for their role, we could reduce the frequency of those errors. And, you know, I ran a pilot, it was really successful. And then I was too busy to do this and tried to outsource it, couldn't outsource it. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's do it uh, yourself. And yeah, that's where the business um, came from. And I have to say, my the company that I work for were fantastic. I told them this is something I really wanted to do. And they're actually now one of my clients. So that's a great relationship to have whenever you leave a company. And yeah, you know, they, they still take the courses on um, since. That's that's an amazing one. I, I thank you so much for sharing your journey. I actually think it's so inspiring for people to hear this journey. You know, an awful lot of the work that we do um, ourselves and, and with our clients is to try educate people on what a career in construction in contemporary construction actually looks like the types of opportunities and the mobility within the industry. And I think maybe that's something that's not well known and it's definitely something that's not well communicated at an early stage. Um, so look, and by the way, I know that you're um, a huge advocate for women in construction. And so even to be able to showcase the path that you've taken to to show the wide varieties, not just of roles, but of sectors, you know, you I, I wouldn't have thought that going from you know, a commercial or logistics environment into a nuclear environment that that would have been, I, I mean, I, I'm i guessing that wasn't a seamless transition. No, and it's, look, I don't think I've ever built the same project twice in my entire career. And there's always that um, apprehension and a bit of a fear of the unknown. But um, that's why you work as part of a team. And um, very much within this you know, environment, you have to rely on the competencies of others and it's a continuing mentoring role as well. So um, yeah, as I say, I, I've went from yeah, airport to train to roads to nuclear and yeah, you, you never do the same thing twice. And I think that's okay. And I think if anything, it's probably one of the real passions for me and why I actually love the construction industry because it's not the same. Like a year, and even if, I, I hate to say it, but even if you really hate the project or don't like it, you know, um, when you're in that project environment, it's going to get built within the next couple of years and you're going to move on. So that's good as well. And and maybe, yeah, the, the ones that are really good, you're going to miss them. Um, but I think it's such a, a great and a dynamic industry and very much open for everyone, you know, as a woman in construction, it has never got in my way. It has never, you know, been to my detriment. Yes, I've had challenges because of my gender um, in construction, but it's never got in the way. And I think it's definitely a career that's open for everybody. And, and that's why I do the advocacy in it. And even um, whenever I had like my kids, I remember walking around site um, really pregnant and, uh, you know, people like there was, it's great to see there's more and more women coming into construction now but like um you know 22 23 year old girls and that sites in how are you doing this how are you managing a family and this career and the whole thing and my response to them was look if you're good at your job it'll be fine don't worry yeah. about it you don't know what's coming around the corner keep going yeah. if you're good at your job it'll all work out and it'll be fine but I think that was even important too to be waddling around the site you know six yeah. to eight months pregnancy it's entirely you know you're we're all capable of doing this and it's definitely an industry for everyone that's that's a really powerful message and I'm really glad you you shared that today and um, you know only in the last number of months I was telling the story of somebody I had interviewed and um she talked about being uh, pregnant on site and that one of her challenges was that the site team, who mainly men, to be fair, had never seen a pregnant woman on site. So they were overly careful, overly cautious in a way that she felt it stopped her doing her job. And she was in health and safety and had to inspect places at height. And um, so 
she was almost frustrated by their concern and they thought they were doing the right thing. And so it just, I, I think it shows not just the need for a little bit of um, a common sense approach as well, mm-hmm. but also actually we need to normalise people at all stages, whether male and female at all stages of life. Um, you know, so whether it's making a uh, compensating for, um, you know, women at, uh, um, who might be experiencing, um, temperature you know one of the things we've covered recently as well is around um maybe the lack of suitability of ppe gear you know at, at for people who are um experiencing hormonal um thermal flashes and um or for people at menopause or perimenopause stage and you know th- there are so many different you know, humans being human whether you're male or female at uh, whether you're young middle-aged or older there's there's a set of concerns there are changes that happen and on site i think maybe the human approach at the end of the day even in in an increased digital environment construction is still a people business we are still dependent on people on the ground actually getting stuff done and and that means the basics of good communication good collaboration again a common sense approach um you know a courtesy uh uh collegiality really um coming together and it's there's no compensation for it you know it's great that we have digital tools that make a lot of this easier and streamline it but we still need people to be human at their core and connect with the people uh, that they're coming into contact with on a day-to-day basis and you know i i always have a focus on the technology and every so often i'm reminded that actually we're still dependent on the the humans and the human interaction. So I think that's a really powerful reminder for us there. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of the courses that you're offering, because you were coming very strongly from industry and um, so despite having come up and, um, and, and trained and graduated through the through academia, obviously you were coming at uh, identifying the gaps from a very industry-based, um, uh, industry-centered approach. In terms of the gaps, where are you seeing those gaps in the industry now? So you, let's talk about your Into the Construction Industry course. What what does that cover? What kind of work do you cover for people, graduates and newcomers? Yeah, so the courses, as I said, they're very much in around those inspecting skills. So we have one for concrete, one for earthworks, um, piling, drainage. It's... Uh, People might not think they're glamorous, but yeah, we're we're, we're telling you how to um, put a manhole together. Um, the earthworks one's really interesting. So we do everything from sort of cut fill planning and how to look at productivity right through to assessing carbon emissions from earthworks operations and yeah, make, making sure um, productivity is out there and it's um, key and what your building is going to be built right first time. So the likes of um, compaction testing um, and how actually to read the specifications and things like that. Every job has a different specification and um getting the people familiar with how to read specifications and actually how to understand them and how to apply them out on site is a key part of of all of those roles or of all of those courses. Um, So that's very much um, involved in that. We also have sort of like a mid-tier course um, and that would be for anyone from sort of site engineer to project manager role and it's around um, inspection and testing within the construction um, industry. So it's about how to write an inspection and test plan and more and more so this is becoming um, really front and centre and I can even see it over like the last 10 years of my career. So you have the BQR regulations in the Republic of Ireland and you're having um, the new Building Safety Act in England um, as well and a lot of the main contractors I work for are working in one of those areas and that inspection and test plan it's a bit like a method statement and risk assessment but it's a for so a method statement risk assessment make sure that the people um that are building that house wall um uh, item are safe while they're doing it so it thinks about the people and making sure they're safe the inspection test plan thinks about the product so it's looking at that um reinforced concrete wall that you're building and it's saying okay how have you planned to make sure this is going to be installed correctly how have you inspected it and how are you going to test it to make sure it complies with the legislation so very much 
that's those uh, contractors evidence to comply with the likes of BQR or the Building Safety Act. And that one's becoming more and more popular as well, because people just haven't had to deliver on that before. And now they're being asked for it more and more by clients. Now they're being asked for it more and more by even like their sort of risk and assurance team to make sure that in 10 years time, if there's any issues come up, there's evidence and there's information. And and similarly, you spoke about digital tools and digital products. It's how do you integrate all of those things together? So very much I'm a digital first approach. And if you can get a machine to do um, the heavy lifting, let's get the machine to do the heavy lifting. And what we would do is we would help them integrate it with the likes of maybe Procore or um, Autodesk 360 Field or any of those sort of um, applications where you're actually going out there and using an iPad for inspections, but linking all that information back. Um, so there's that traceability in, in what you build in the future. Um, I can see absolutely the role for, you know, learning how, how and where to integrate those, those digital tools. You know, in recent shows, we've covered a lot about, you know, trying to understand what the tech stack of a contemporary construction contractor looks like, what that might be, how many pieces of technology, how do they, where do they all sit and how do they integrate well together? Um, but, you know, when you were talking about the introductory course, you know, I, I, I would have perhaps wrongly assumed that what you're describing there is on the job training. So does that not work? You know, back 20 years ago, we used to call that kind of the sitting by Nelly approach, you know, the, does that not happen anymore? This on the job training, um, and and is that is that the gap you're you're filling with that particular yeah. introductory course? It it very much is. Um, like I was lucky enough, I suppose, to graduate in two thousand and four, and I remember whenever I graduated, I had. Uh, so I was yet yeah, 22. I had like a 24, 26 year old teaching me the latest setting out techniques with the latest technology. I also had a 60 year old guy making me use a tape measure and three, four, five and everything and down with technology and we're not doing it. So I had the benefit of learning both ways, one from like years and years of really good experience and one from here's the latest tech. And Throughout like my career, that was there and it was available right up to that 2008. And then you had the crash of the construction industry. And like a lot of people, they left the construction industry. And I am um, living through it. Like I went to Australia, I think like 2008 and came back and actually lived sort of through that. And those that raft of people left. So we seen maybe about five years later, there was... They were missing the 26 year olds with the latest technology with three to four years out on site to teach those graduates and those graduates never got taught. So if anything, it created a shift in the mentoring role within the construction industry because it was such a big loss. And I think there um, that has continued on and um, going forwards and look. If you ever spend um, any time on site, you'll see the likes of site managers and project managers they're all in the office, you know, they've all really busy jobs to do. And there's a lack of availability for them actually to be on site. And I think, yeah, the the repercussions of that recession um, are still being felt today. And that's why we're all in for let's do this, you know, on a one day, a really intensive, but you get a lot of information on that day. And yeah, it's also good, I always think, to hear from somebody else outside of the industry sometimes, you know, maybe we get a bit of... um. I don't know, switch off mode if you have the same thing being told to you by the same person all the time. So I think there's a benefit to them as well. Um, some of the larger companies actually integrate it within um, a training pathway, which I think is really good. So um, one company, they are really, you know, focusing on competency improvement within their business. So we have actually included the Institute of Civil Engineering attributes at the end of each course. So we talk about concrete, for example, and then the ICE attribute would be um, like problem solving. How do you plan to ensure you're doing well? And we talk about how what they've learned that day could help them you know, fill in their ICE attribute and actually help them towards their chartership application. And very similar with the Chartered Institute of Builders, you could also use that for your chartership application when you're in that mind frame and you have that focus. Um, I would imagine as well, it's also a safe space for people to ask questions if they're not, uh, if they're not learning something within their everyday working team that actually they, they might feel safer to ask a question that they think they really should know by now. 
Exactly. And that's what it's good actually having a room full of young people and um, to do that as well. So, you know, I start every course off with there's no such thing as a stupid question. You know, the stupid thing is not to ask the question. You need to know the answer. Um, and, and I would say and very much the exercises we do, we keep it practical and engaging. But we also do it like in a teamwork environment. So if you do not know, ask the person beside you, because in a real life scenario, that's exactly what I would do. I would be like, oh, I don't know this. You know, I don't trust Google. It's not good enough or YouTube to actually teach you how to civil engineer. But look, you can ask somebody else um, with more knowledge or, or specialist in that environment. And very much that's where we are. And even right down to the things like um, to read a reinforced concrete drawings, not the easiest thing in the world. It looks like a complete different language. And, and every once in a while, I'm 20 years into it, I pick it up and I go, Right, I need to remember how to do this. You know, there's a wee bit of re-education of myself and I have to take five minutes to think about what I'm doing. Um, and like I would ask them, can you read that drawing? And I would say as a general answer to it, these are apprenticeship level and graduate level, um, you know, engineers or or people that have, you know, studied sort of a construction course. Um, maybe about 70% of them say no. And like, you know, as supervisors out there, they should know how to do these things and they should, but mm. you just don't get taught to that level um, in university or in tech and they don't have the resources, you know, they can't bring you out there, they can't show you an actual piece of reinforcement and explain which, um, it, what, what means what, and I think that's the real benefit. Um. Yeah, I, I think the benefits are very clear. In fact, if anything, you're making me maybe nervous or, or cautious about maybe what goes unknown on sites um if if the team don't feel able to ask questions um you know one thing i i as you're speaking i'm becoming aware that actually you know given that you created the business in 2021 based on maybe the gaps that you would have observed you would have observed uh, throughout your career now that you're actually delivering training um, and so you're learning from the next generation coming in and from um, the clients now who are requesting these courses. Are you identifying further gaps? Is this leading to maybe courses that you might not have envisaged in 2021? Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's more courses and, you know, clients will come to me and say, this is where we're having a problem. We're having a problem with this. We're losing money in this um you know we keep speaking to our staff or our team and we just can't get it right and we just can't you know look at you know get past this and very much so we've been you know building out either bespoke courses for them based on on that's their issue or adding to um courses you know going on in the future and very much so what i didn't want and it was a fear of mine that be taking a step out of industry how am I going to keep this information relevant and up to date and um, good going forwards and that's actually where the business works out really well with the training and consultancy side so even on, on the consultancy side um, sometimes I'll work as a clerk of works so for client side and I'll actually go out there and do some inspecting and I can see you know the latest that that's going on and, and the mistakes that are continuing to happen um, and I also work as a building a safer future assessor and also a code for construction product index verifier so they're a bit of a mouthful but um, the BSF is all about um, cultural maturity uh, with regards to the Building Safety Act um, uh, over in the UK and it's backed by Dame Judith Hackett so it's very much keeping me in front of changes within that Building Safety Act um, environment and how that's working and CCPA is Code for Construction Product Index so that's very much more around um, manufacturers of construction products and making sure that the information they release is accurate, up to date, always accessible. Same thing, it's came off the back of the Building Safety Act but it's making sure that people that are buying construction products understand what they're buying um, and that the literature and information isn't misleading with regard to construction products. So I think they're really good because they um, are different. They, you know, give me good knowledge and a good insight into the sector and where the sector's moving and um, going forwards. And I, well, I suppose that's definitely a question I have before we finish up today. Um, how are your clients, what are their, your clients' sentiments towards construction over the next kind of 18 uh, to 24 months? Because it has been a particularly challenging few years. 
it has and look you see the figures and you can see the amount of companies going out of business and it is incredibly um, sad and I think a lot of people are taking stock at the moment and they are absolutely risk averse um, and look in the last year if you had been operating in the black at all you were doing well so if you were breaking even you were doing well rather than you know uh, recording a, a, a loss and um, so look some of them I think have been more cautious but they're very looking very much have been looking at their books and saying right where can we tighten up here where can we actually operate more efficiently and where are these losses happening and I love to see that coming forwards whenever they go to um, have that review and I think the ones you know that invest in training or investing in a return on on that in the next you know six months in the next 12 months in the hope that they can improve their profit margins that way and actually have more efficient um staff and as i say less errors um in that point but yeah i, th- I think the market it's, it's going to change and um i think they're also more open to bringing in um, specialists because they're all dealing with a lot at the moment and, and I understand that so there's the requirements for sustainability reporting you know net carbon zero there's uh, the whole you know movement and you know equality and um, diversity and inclusion and um, there's this push on quality in construction as well so they're dealing with a lot and I think they've real a lot of them have realized look if we can bring in sector expertise in these individual el- areas to help us you know review our strategy and figure out the best way forwards then I think they're really benefiting from that as well yeah absolutely and I suppose finally what can we expect to see from construct tuition in 2024 um so we're going to go global um uh, <laughs> no I would I would just be um really happy with uh yeah continued growth uh, you know we've been growing year on year um and yeah a, a few more staff coming on board and what we would like to do is certainly um help more main contractors within um Ireland and the UK um move yeah you know increase quality within their business and whether that's you know sort of systems and, and improvements that way or or better people trained out on site but yeah watch this space because we've got lots of plans coming for 2024 and let's say we're always um open for companies you know to get in touch and see how we can work together and collaborate on on really benefiting their business that's super and i think improving quality and construction is something we can all get behind so um thank you and and continued success with uh, construct tuition um that was lorna hagan director of construct tuition my thanks today to show producer katie talon and to the production team at hear me roar media also thank you to place engage for making these conversations possible and thank you indeed for tuning in we'll catch you on the next episode of breaking ground in the meantime please be sure to subscribe and check out all of the other irish and international real estate and construction shows on iProperty Radio. 